as many of you know, this was originally thought of as an adjunct to a state grant that Jane mentioned, where we were looking at all the sites around Pig Point. We're sort of calling it the Pig Point Site Complex. And it was Dennis Curry that had the idea of, well, we should get, you know, some of the big names together and talk about what all this means. So uh, Al kind of envisioned uh, 20 people in a room talking to each other and, and, and a less formal thing than we're going to end up with here. Um, some of you may remember the Mid-Atlantic started with 20 people in a room, and now it's three concurrent sessions, student papers and poster sessions. But uh, anyway, if this seems informal, it was intended to be informal. If, if it uh, works, uh, thank God, and if it doesn't, so be it. <laughs> um, I myself have the problem of, uh, I was gonna give one of my normal pig point talks and I thought, well, this is a pretty educated audience and this is a bunch of stuff that's happened since the Mid-Atlantic Journal came out that most of you have read. So I need to add more detail to my talk. So I'm gonna try to be running through the first part of this talk because many of you have seen it before. But uh, it is important I think to reinforce the cautionary tale that Pig Point provides. Uh, we dug for three years on one side of the road very hard and we thought we knew something about what we were doing and then we moved 80 feet and our whole world changed. So this is uh, the classic cautionary tale. Uh, before I forget uh, Frank and Suzanne Talbot who actually own the, the oh wonderful, actually own the Sacred Hilltop. Uh, Suzanne is here in the audience and she deserves a round of applause for putting up with it. <laughs> so anyway, this, uh, that's my lead in slide we've all stared at. Uh, I'm rather proud of this because I took this out of the window of an airliner uh, landing at BWI. Oh, wow. And, and <laughs> they now use it as the Jug Bay uh, a brochure for the sanctuary here. But that's the setting. Uh, Pig Point is located on a, so I don't shoot my eye out here. <laughs> there we go. Pig Point is lo lo located on a peninsula sticking out into what is one of the largest freshwater tidal marshes uh, on the east coast at the moment. And notice the western branch of the Patuxent going off this way. Um, what we we're excited about to start with is, even though we were up on top of a bluff, Pig Point was very deep. Uh, Mandy's pointed out there's been some sniffing about how deep it actually is. There's about a foot and a half of historic stuff, which includes 17th, 18th, and 19th century. Then there's about a foot and a half of a dark woodland period, midden. And then there's up to four feet of archaic. So. If you hear Al occasionally using seven feet in 10,000 years, uh, there, there's some rationale behind it. Uh, we have 16 C14 dates from south of Wrighton Road. And glory be, they all worked out. Uh, we have features going down this whole column. Uh, the oldest one was over 9,000 years old. And uh, very unusual for an archeological site not to have the C14 dates all scrambled. The ceramic types, the four basic types in the region, prove to seriate exactly like they're supposed to seriate, according to the paradigm. Uh, sometimes, and it's not all this good, but sometimes projectile point styles would actually seriate themselves if you lay them out on a table according to where they were found. And for example, Piscataway, there's been a lot of discussion about where Piscataway points fits. Well, this is the pre-ceramic line. So uh, I'm mainly considering it a late archaic phenomenon that just leaks into the early woodland. The other big thing was finding uh, archaic period triangles like Dr. Stewart has up in New Jersey there. We don't have time to explain what unifacial micro discs are. That's another 15 minute talk. We were excited early on because we were seeing uh, posts, uh, sections of buildings, uh, stretches, arcs of, of posts. Uh, if you had sufficient wine on board, you could actually make ovals out of them that are approximately the size that they're supposed to be. So we were pretty excited about that, but even more excited as we went down and realized strata through strat, um, deeper we got, we kept seeing partial patterns of buildings. 
going back into the late archaic. So a, a point that will be raised again later, we're finding structures in the same spot for 3,000 years. Now, we immediately went to an environmental explanation because it's on the lee of the hill, but there are other possible explanations for what we found. Um, here's an example of Jane Cox working on one of the early uh, archaic pits. Uh, I like to point out the fact that we got some great dates out of this thing and we got some unidentified animal bone, we got freshwater mussel, we got white perch, we got yellow perch, we got hickory nuts. And even though it's 8,000 years ago, and even though the sea level's different and the climate's different and everything's different, boy, this is exactly the kind of stuff you could get at Pig Point this afternoon. Yellow perch, white perch. We also were enamored of the fact that we were finding things that seemed just a tad more spectacular than we were used to. Uh, prehistoric pottery around here um, it's usually decorated just in the, as you, most of you know, a thin band around the rim. Here we have a, a vessel, and shockingly enough, it's, it's mockley. It's a thin mockley out of a middle woodland context, and it's decorated rim to base all the way around. And not only that, again, with sufficient alcohol, one could even fantasize that you were <laughs> seeing some kind of a precursor to a Mississippian hanging uh, woodpecker, but uh, we won't go there. Uh, continuing on that vein of unusual stuff, uh, crenellated rim, fabric impressed, incised two different ways, uh, 355 BC, uh, it shouldn't be. This is Akakik, but it's coated with uh, red ochre. We found several of these. This is Pope's Creek, which you almost never see decorated except in some extremely crude way. And here they've used finger. Uh, presses to make hanging triangles on a Pope's Creek shirt. That's also unusual. A lot of woodland period sites in Maryland, you find pipes, there's basically one type of pipe. You'll find a lot of them. Uh, pig point, no two types are the same. So we started suspecting, is this a gathering place for different groups? Is that explaining why we're seeing different types of pipes? Uh, we found a lot of these gorget fragments. That first we uh, didn't pay too much attention to, and then we realized that they had this habit of, of scratching in size decoration on them, and in many instances you could prove that it had been done after the thing was broken. Uh, we don't quite know what it means. Uh, Dennis called this the Rosetta Stone. Uh, it looks like they're deliberately breaking these gorgets. It looks like different people are getting different pieces and doing different things to them. Uh, so it looks like we're getting a glimmer of some kind of ritual behavior that was heretofore unsuspected. Also, uh, real excited about a Flint Ridge Chalcedony Hopewell style point. We got about a dozen marginella, a dozen shark's teeth. We're not used to this. Uh, a single copper bead, we were really excited. Uh, more on that topic later. We, uh, is it Tom Emerson at Illinois? Uh, ran the, uh, these two pipe fragments for us and proved con rather conclusively that they came from the Fuard Hill Quarry. And there's Flint Ridge, of course, where the Hopewell Point came from. And I'd like to point out, for those of you into alien archaeology, Fuart Quarry and the Pig Point site are on the same latitude to the second, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and Darren pointed out that so is Cape Penlopen, where you get the marginella beads. <laughs> um, okay, here's the cautionary tale part of the talk. We've been moving to the north. We were right up against Wrighton Road, the limits of our uh, available space. And if anything, the strangeness of the place increased. We started finding things like dog burials. This, this was a wonderfully killed point in situ, um, but jumbled enough that you knew it wasn't like just stepped on. And then another Flint Ridge, and this time Adena style. Okay, here's where Suzanne's kindness comes in. We finally got permission to cross the road, and you can't see right in road. It's in the foreground here. I'm standing literally on the other side of the road and shooting across it. And you can see north of the road is not exactly a conducive place to do archaeology. There are problems over there. There are houses and garages and sheds and driveways 
going in all directions. So we got permission to look in this little block, it had a big tree, but this little area was open to us. And so we thought, well, we're getting up to the top of the hill, it'll be deflated, pig point will finally be shallow, and, and well, no, that's not what happened. 80 feet away from where we'd been digging, we discovered that there was this huge pit, uh, virtually centered on the four driveways, by the way. It seems like the people that laid the driveways knew it was there. But uh, this was not what we were expecting. We were expecting shallow on top of the hill, and once again, we're going to end up going down over seven feet at Pig Point. We immediately started finding these uh, fragments of Adena blades, well-made, large Adena blades that have just been destroyed, totally smashed with radial fractures. Uh, the flint, the material for these things comes from a variety of sources, but all Midwestern. Uh, you couldn't make one of these things out of rhyolite or something and kill it. Yeah, you had to use stuff from Ohio or even further out. Burlington, I think, is Missouri or someplace like that. Ohio pipestone tube pipes. We were excited about the two that uh, we had found south of the road. We now have hundreds from north of the road. But unlike Darren's display cases back there where he, other Delmarva Adena sites will occasionally leave you a nice large unbroken pipe or half broken pipe, at Pig Point, the blades and the pipes are just thoroughly destroyed. So it might be that we're onto something a little different than the other sites. Uh, we were real excited about one copper bead. We're now, I don't know, Jasmine 300 something or? 350, uh, we've increased that. And this, by the way, one of my favorite pictures, that's a single shovel test pit. <laughs> I like shovel test pits with uh, eight copper beads in them. Okay, to give you some idea, uh, what else was in the pit besides smashed blades and smashed pipes was smashed bone. And I'm just showing you this to give you some idea that we're not actually encountering bundle burials. We're not actually encountering even a cremation burial where there's sort of a unified spot. And this is a, yes, you can see it more in this dark band, but there are plenty of bone fragments in all of these strats inside the pit. So at first we wondered, you know, what this was. Uh, truthfully, it was two, two weeks before we could actually prove it was human. The first to tooth showed up two weeks later. Then we started wondering about cannibalism, but eventually determined that it was mostly dry bone fracture, so that was, that was off the table. But you started looking at this stuff, mainly, by the way, long bones and skulls, and you could see definitive evidence that they had been chopped and, and otherwise bludgeoned and cut. Um, here's just an example of a cut. Uh, there are some things that look like insect damage. There are some things that look like rodent damage. Uh, uh, Stacy's hoping that she sees some carnivore bites. I'm not quite buying it yet. But uh, what we definitely are seeing is a lot of human modification going on here. Obviously, the copper staining is just an artifact of something else going on, but here are cut bones and ground bones. Um, we encountered ochre at various places throughout these pits, but down at the very bottom was this incredible concentration of red ochre. And in this incredible concentration of red ochre is one of the larger pieces of human skull that we were ultimately going to find. Plus it had a perfectly formed suspension hole and had red ochre in it. Uh, to me, this is a classic Adena Hopewell, other side of the mountains, it's a human skull cup, it's right down to the suspension hole. And then I also want to, I'm showing you rather more bone than I usually do when I give this talk. There are a number of very strange punctures that don't look like rodents. Um, Doug Owsley, who uh, by the way can't be here, and I neglected to tell you Jess Robinson's plane got canceled last night, so he's not here, Jeff, uh, today. Anyway, Doug Owsley suggested, well, maybe it's insect damage, although I've never seen that like that before. And, and if anybody can say, I've never seen that 
that before, and it's Doug Owsley. I don't know where we, we take that. Uh, some of them, to me, are obviously human agency. That's, that's a cut, uh, forming that hole. And some are just over the top bizarre. And uh, Dennis Curry sent me uh, a nice paper by Spiel on the fact that around the Great Lakes, uh, late woodland, Huron, ossuary period, they were actually trying to re-articulate skeletons by essentially stitching them together. Uh, by the way, here's a, you know, an oval mortuary pit, vaguely the same size as the ones from Pig Point. Now, mind you, if this is going on at Pig Point, and I'm suspicious it might be, but if it is, they're taking them down and smashing them before they're throwing them into this pit. And what we sort of have a concept of, uh, you know, why you'd kill an object and put it in a grave so that it'll go to the afterlife. But why you'd kill the bones as well is, is something that there's not much uh, I can turn to, which is why I'm trying to get all this brain power together to tell me what's going on here. Now, around the pits, not in the pits, but around the pits, we kept finding these little bits of ritual behavior. Uh, Matt McKnight here uh, in a fire-reddened area found this little bag-o-smashed uh, Delmarva quartz lancelets. Notice the missing pieces. Uh, it's not because we missed them. So whatever deposit this was, it had been smashed in advance and pieces are missing. And then uh, there are no gorgets in any of the pits and yet right on the lip of a pit one was this uh, wonderful Ohio banded slate uh, gorget. Virtually the only Adena artifact we were to find at Pig Point that wasn't killed and it's outside of the pit. Now the first three years we were in the lower block and the upper block and a little bit downhill. This is a strange perspective, but this is a bluff and this is a lowland and this is the river. So this is where the deep deposits, this is where the wigwams were. This was an area with incredible numbers of hearths going back 8,000 years and more. This is our little four-sided area that we could look in. You avoided the tree, we dug here. Then we got permission to do STPs in the area outlined in red here. Thanks again to Suzanne. Found a second pit, a third pit, a fourth pit, and a fifth pit. It, just in the area we're allowed to look. Uh, repeated attempts to get permission to just cross the six feet onto the other side of this driveway have been to no avail so far, but hope springs eternal. But anyway, obviously a large number of a ritual mortuary pits on top of a prominent bluff overlooking the Patuxent. I'm just going to show you real quickly uh, more to show you the technical difficulties of trying to get a sample out of these other pits. Pit 2 and Pit 5 are smack up against a tenant house and are virtually off limits. You, we can't dig there. Uh, this is Pit 3 and as you can see uh, driveways on all sides. I'm standing on the driveway to take this picture. And the thing's ultimately going to prove to be seven feet deep. Oh, uh, go back to pit three, John, if you can do it. Yeah, I should mention uh, pit three is the only one to have Norman Skilcock Saki, including what you might call um, Selby Bay Point, and this very distinctive speckled jasper, um, only out of pit three. Now, uh, as w I'll talk about later, the dating, they're going back into these pits for centuries. They're digging back into these pits. So why one pit would only be the only place where you'd find a certain type of flake? These flakes are not in the areas around the pits. They are in the pits. Uh, pit four, showing you again the technical difficulties involved, the smack between a shed and a garage, and I'm again standing on a driveway. And again, it's going to go seven feet deep. It had a degraded hematite cell. It had a hematite paint cup. Each of the three pits that we were able to do samples of had a single paint cup. Pit three had a um, serpentine, and, and one in the four had uh, hematite. And then a uh, 
some kind of shell with a hole drilled in it, maybe a shell gorget or something, but uh, uh, interesting artifact to find in the pit. So Pig Point joins a group of sites that are known as the Delmarva Adena. And I realize I'm using the word Adena a lot, and I'm staring at Burley Clay, who doesn't even like the use of the word Adena or tells everybody that they're using it wrong. So he'll be up next and can and straighten me out. And uh, some people will wonder why I don't include Nassauango. And, and it's a number of reasons. Dating is one of them. Artifacts is another. It doesn't have the Ohio blades, for example, that all the rest of these do. Darren's got some interesting information about, you know, the band here between this concentration and this concentration and where this stuff turns up as isolates. Hopefully we'll get to see that later. Okay, we don't know much about the Delmar Vedina, even though we've been arguing about it for 80 years. These are the best excavations that were conducted heretofore. Uh, West River in 1955, done by the ASM, they interpreted this as two pits. I keep looking at it and wondering whether it's three. And if it wasn't for Ron Thomas going back and reevaluating what was done at St. John's in 1960, we wouldn't have any, a map this good. But he came up with uh, things he called areas or loci or something. But it looks to me like they, in fact, were encountering the same size, which is roughly, you know, 22 by 15 uh, oval pits uh, that, that are part of the Delmarva Adena complex. C14 dates. We have from the main pits themselves nine dates in a rem remarkably restricted. Uh, 490 year stretch, five centuries. I, I, of course, these are conventional dates I'm using uh, to facilitate comparison with the older literature. I, of course, frequently used average two sigmas and stuff, which get a little wider and wilder. But anyway, there's, there's a pretty clear concentration of dates, and then there are two. The oldest date north of the road came out of a small feature just south of one of the main pits. And the latest by Boodles came out of another feature. And these, these warrant showing you the context. Uh, John. This is the early date. It's just south of, root of uh, pit one. It came back 270 BC. Uh, it had right about in here near the top this strange little bundle of burned stuff, including a human tooth or two, and uh, almost looks like some kind of a, a, a bag. And then down at the very bottom, a couple of disparate smashed long bones, and essentially nothing else. There's some copper beads. and So the question with feature 307, 323 is, and they're connected in different squares. You know how that happens. Um, is this a close precursor to what happens in the large pits, or is this some kind of ancillary activity to what happens in the large pits? I can't actually answer, but right now it could be either. And then... That's the one that you found close pre-wearing, isn't it? Yes. Uh, closer to Patuxent, but well, yes, Creek. Pope's Creek wear. Right. right. Uh, feature 246, which came back at 600 A.D. or something. It's not the dark thing there, it's the lighter thing. That's 246. Notice how it conforms to the edge of pit one. That's a bulk in pit one, the other edge is over here. It looked for all the world like it was part of pit one, although it was fairly shallow and fairly discreet, but it had great charcoal, it had pipe fragments, it had uh, rhyolite flakes and mockley wear, I think, in it. And it came back um, 620 A.D. Uh, had us thinking about, believe it or not, uh, intrusive mound culture, which <laughs> at the same period in the Ohio Valley, people were going over and plugging holes in their mounds around 600 A.D. and doing things. So this would be the intrusive pit culture, if, if, if so be it. Uh, Burley's shaking over there, but I'll live with it. Uh, 
Uh, excuse the hand on nature of this, but I wanted to show my C14 dates comparison to the others available from classic Delmarva Adena. Here's our 10 or 9, depending on how you look at it. Here's the aberrant one. The 8 from West River obtained in what's 59, 60, essentially running the same span, but West River has 200 year plus or minus with them and ours have 30, so maybe we're just a slight refinement and we're dating the same thing. And as you can see, other Delmar Vadina sites, it's fairly pathetic. We've got one from St. Jones and two from Bone from Frederica, but they're all pretty much in this same band. Now here's Nassawango, which is, to my way of thinking, perhaps a precursor of some kind. Rosencrans in New Jersey doesn't have Midwestern Flint and also is earlier. And then Jay's Forte Island Field, except for 246, basically Island Field is not overlapping with this, with this grouping. So I think if nothing else, Pig Point is helping to refine the dates, at least over here, for this phenomenon. Uh, we had a, I recently read a wonderful paper by Brad, who's here today on uh, obtaining C14 dates from the original Adena mound. And he got three dates that fell right into this wonderful band. He, he used this as an excuse to gather together the 31 known Adena dates and put them on this graph. But if you think of this thing as a normal curve and you look at it, the ones at the extremes are aberrant and they have the largest uncertainties. So Al thinks, well, is there some way to reduce this 1,325 year time span to something more manageable? For example, if you throw out the three highest and three lowest, like you're taking a normal curve and whacking off the ends, you can get it down to a 550 year span with 25 of the 31 dates. And then when you compare that to the pig point span, you see that we're starting later. And we're in fact continuing later. Now it's, it's sort of been a well documented, uh, well known that uh, the Delmarva Dina includes Hopewellian aspects to it, that it does seem to outlast the Adena. Every time I'm using that word I'm, I'm, I feel burly over there going like this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, um, sometimes this worked out um, this is pit four, this is a seven foot profile, 100 BC, 280 AD. Notice again how the bone is deposited here. It's, it's almost, you know, sprinkled indiscriminately through the, the fill. But pig point didn't always uh, fulfill our hopes. After about you know, 25 C14 dates that made perfect sense, we got these C14 dates out of pit one. 20 BC, 100 AD, 180 AD. Sort of absolutely reversed. But if you look at what's going on in pit one, where they're digging back in over and over and over again, the only explanation I can use is that all this repeated mixing and re-excavation re is the, the explanation for this. That's a 200 year span. We have spans in pit three and four that are, are approaching 400 years of people re-digging into the same spot. Okay, we had spent three years south of the road and three years north of the road, but we started looking back south of the road thinking, did we really understand what we were doing over there? I told you we had wigwams in one spot for 3,000 years. Could it be some other explanation than that's getting out of the prevailing winds? And I started to look at what I call value-loaded artifacts. And the distributions are pretty shocking. Here's Wrighton Road, which is a perfectly modern road. Here's the 80 feet gap. And this is really showing you how our world changed. We had a couple of those pipestone pipes and we have hundreds and a couple of Dina blades and again a hundred at least. But notice the pipestone pipes are only in the feasting area and the blades are only in the wigwam area. Banded slate is only north of the road. Copper beads except for a single one 
north of the road. And in a completely different distribution type, no, we go back one, John. Um, ceramic pipes, look at this. Not only are they sort of vaguely making a circle around the wigwams and heavily concentrated in the feasting area, but they're totally lacking north of the road. Gray slate gorgets, same, same. Uh, fossil shark's teeth, I was, I recently, yesterday, found out there's one that came out of the plow zone up here and there's one out of a, out of a uh, STP, but basically there's, it's like the road was there all along if you, you look at this distribution pattern. And finally, a final pattern, uh, shell beads and bone beads only down in what I'm calling the feasting area except for that single example again in the plow zone. So the grant that we have now is to, to branch out beyond this. If, if, you know, like I say, with sufficient alcohol, you've now got a feasting area, a wigwam area, and a ritual area. And you start looking at what else is going on. Well, we've known about the Door Village site for the last 70 years. ASM's tried to dig there a couple of times, but it's a huge site. It goes on for over a mile. And we spent a year dropping units in there last year. And if you study the place, there's a couple of spots, three as a matter of fact, where it looks like there's these strange human altered paths to get off this ridge top and down to the flat. Uh, for example, there, there's a wide road-looking thing next to this pond, and as it comes up the hill, I mean, when somebody asked me once, what is it? And I went, oh, that's just some kind of historic cart path or something. But if you follow it, as it comes up the hill, it gets narrower and narrower and narrower, and by the time you get to the crest of the ridge, it's wide enough for one person and nothing else. So it couldn't have been a historic road. And we've got, believe it or not, an earthen circle, which I don't quite believe myself, but it is there and I don't have a good explanation for it and I've shown it to quite several of you people. Um, so God knows, uh, do we have an earthen circle? And I didn't avail myself of the LIDAR maps of Door because if, 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 you know, actually that takes a couple glasses of wine, but boy, can you see stuff going on there. <laughs> My geologist assures me it's all Pleistocene sand dunes, and I'm like, dude. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so the grant we have now is to look at what we're starting to call the Pig Point Site Complex. We've got 14 sites within a one-mile radius, and, and that's even, you know, think about how many sites are actually in PR9. And this was previously reported. So what's going on? If moving 80 feet can change our world. What's, you know, going a quarter mile up or down river going to do to, to the story here? Now, as you all know, the Native Americans were fond of using prominent bluffs near water as a place to inter the dead. Uh, this one's on the Missouri River. Uh, and interestingly, all over on the Potomac mainly, but uh, late woodland ossuaries on prominent locations next to the water, a number of pits filled with bundle burials. There's no bone smashing going on necessarily, but it's the same concept. It's a group of pits on a bluff overlooking the water. Uh, one would immediately think they were somehow related, but there's a thousand year gap between the dating that we have from Pig Point and the dating of these late woodland ossuaries. But you can certainly see, and uh, that why Pig Point fills, the, you're up on the hilltop here, I tried to make, get a shot where you could see this. Uh, large flat area beneath a prominent bluff next to the water. Um, I never, as you can tell from that talk, uh, put long texts up there and I sure the hell aren't going to read them to you because it drives me crazy when other people do. But, and these are a little dated, but here's Don Dragoo complaining about the database for the Adena being so poor. I don't know whether you'd say it, it's improved much in the, in the intervening period, but this one's even more important. Here's Ron Thomas talking about the Delmarva Adena. He's just tried to do um, St. John's. He tried to make sense out of the excavation reports. 
And he said that, uh, you know, the questions I've got aren't going to be answered until we find more of these sites and dig them. Well, that was 45 years ago, and Pig Point's the first one to be found and dug since he made that statement. So that concludes Al's PowerPoint part of the talk. <laughs> I'm hoping that the assembled brain power will, uh, will be able to answer these questions. We've got more questions than... Uh, than answers.